Jarvis, drop my needle. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and we are finally going to wrap up the Mike Costa run of Venom, uh, which was came out right before the Donny Cates run, I think like a couple months before, and uh, I thought Mike overall did a good job. I really did, and actually, as we went through the stuff he's done so far, um, I, you know, I got a, a different appreciation for it. When it first came out, I was kind of like a mixed bag, and then it started to lose me a little bit because I don't think I was really appreciating the fun because if you remember back when I started this show, I didn't know as much as I do now, obviously, about Venom. Um, I just like had a, a blanket idea of who I thought Venom was, and I kind of liked him as a villain, and I kind of liked, you know, I was kind of going in that uh, point of view. I also did like the, the Lethal Protector version too, but I still wasn't like, you know, I'm not as knowledgeable as I was now, which makes a ton of sense because now we've done 700 plus episodes on the character. But, uh, but when we started the show, I was really it wasn't embracing kind of some of the schlock and the fun that Mike Costa was having. And it wasn't until the nativity storyline that I actually was like, oh, wow, this was a great ending to this run because it started off this run with, you know, uh, Lee Price being Venom and they had Scorpion in there. And then the, the book kind of ends with Scorpion versus Venom in, in uh, nativity. So if you haven't uh, seen our video on that, we already covered it way back when, when we started this show, like many years ago, a couple years ago now. So uh, I'll put a link to that down below if you want to check it out, because that'll be the conclusion, the actual conclusion of Mike Costa's run. And then after that, he did first host. So, you know, I'll put a link to at least uh, the, the nativity down below. And then if you're watching this on the playlist, you can go and order from there after Nativity will be, you know, the first host and stuff like that. So uh, so this is just the last story we haven't covered yet, which is Venom, Inc. And this was a collaboration. It was a, like kind of a crossover between the Spider-Man books written by Dan Slott and then the Venom book written by Mike Costa. So both Dan Slott and Mike Costa are the writers on this. But we also, for art-wise, we get uh, Gerardo Zandoval, who's been doing some of the Venom stuff on and off uh, around Mark Bagley and everything. And then we have Ryan Stegman, who then from here goes on to actually become the monthly artist of Venom when Donny Cates takes over. And it was a good pick to pick Ryan Stegman because his art in this is awesome. And I like Gerardo Sandoval's art as well. Um, but uh, but obviously, I, the Ryan Stegman's style is kind of more to my liking, but I don't dislike uh, Sandoval's art I just it's a different style you know and it, I think it does work for Venom but uh, if I had to choose I would definitely probably go more of a Ryan Stegman route because it's a little bit more grounded in a way it's a little bit more realistic but sometimes you have stories that are just really crazy and fun and you want someone like a Sandoval to take over and, and do that kind of story um, so I like you know I think they're both have great strengths in their respective areas um, but combining them on this was interesting because we would go to an issue that was written by Dan Slott, and it would be, um, you know, it would have the more grounded art of Ryan Stegman, and then would go to Mike Costa, and it would be like the more fun, over-the-top stuff um, with art by Sandoval, and it actually kind of works. I will say one compliment I'll give this book is to the editors, too, is is how this crossover comes together. It's It's pretty well done from a technical standpoint, as far as like you know, tone and everything like that, and switching artists, but still making it kind of coherent in a way, I, I liked that about this book. That's probably one of the biggest compliments I'll give this book is that even though there's two writers and two artists who have different styles, it blends together pretty well. Now, do I like the story overall? Eh, I'm kind of iffy on it because it brings Lee Price back and it brings him back in kind of the worst way. <laughs> Basically, what Lee Price does is he, you know, breaks or gets out of jail. Obviously, we set that up in the previous, uh, Mike Costa set that up in the previous uh, issues and stuff and we talked about it in previous episodes. But now that he's out, he goes and hunts down Andy in, um, you know, in uh, Philadelphia, and he takes her symbiote. So we actually start off there where we have Mania swinging around. So this is cool because we get some Andy stuff, you know, before she becomes Scream and all that. And uh, and she's taking down some bad guys, and then one of the bad guys hits her with a sonic blast, and it turns out that this person is working for Lee Price, and he put together a little squad, um, and they went to Philadelphia, took down this symbiote because I guess they thought it would be the easier one to take down other than going up against Eddie Brock, which was, I don't know, I mean, Andy's, she's no slouch either, so it was still a calculated risk, especially with her having the hell mark and stuff, um, so I don't know if Lee Price knew about that or, or, you know, got into that, but anyway, they hit her, and they take her symbiote, 
and Lee Price, like, oh, sorry, he, <laughs> I have it here. Uh, Lee Price shows up, takes a symbiote, and becomes Maniac. And so he takes Mania and turns into Maniac. And basically what he does is he goes around spitting the symbiote onto people's faces and turning them into these, like henchmen. So he goes to Scorpion, he goes to Black Cat, you know, because obviously he has a thing against her. He wanted to work for her organization in the first story arc, and she's the new kingpin of crime, or she was at this point in the comic. She's not anymore, obviously. Um, but this is the story that takes her down. She's no longer the, the kingpin after this storyline. Um, so in this one is her, like, her fall from, you know, that status as kingpin, uh, and then back to hero status. And she actually gets a pep talk uh, from Eddie Brock into going back into being a hero. So I kind of like that because... Her and Eddie have a, a, a you know really crazy past because he's he beat her near to half death you know and uh, and so she's always kind of hated Venom and they're forced to kind of work together in the story her and Eddie Brock and Eddie kind of in a way is forgiven by her uh, you know or, or they learn to move on past their pasts because he says like you know I think the city needs more heroes and I think you could do a lot of good. And he sees something in her that she hasn't seen in herself in a while. And uh, and I like that. I thought that was great. And so uh, so there's there's some good character moments in this. There's some neat stuff with uh, Peter Parker. Although Peter is kind of back in that mindset of like, you know what? I hate Venom. And so I'm just going to like fight Venom. <laughs> you know, like he's a monster. I need to destroy the symbiote. Like he's, he's back to that very kind of uh, personal vendetta against the symbiote. Wants to destroy it. And that's kind of how, you know, Peter is in this storyline. And meanwhile, Eddie, he's going around just cleaning up bad guys uh, in New York and stuff and, and trying to mind his own business. But then, of course, crosses paths with, you know, Spider-Man and Black Hat and all these characters. So, you know, and obviously he's going to Alchemex, you know, and he's, uh, he's you know, getting his drugs or whatever that he needs. And Flash Thompson follows him there. So this is what all this is a setup to is basically all the things that happen. You know, Flash Thompson got the suit taken away from him. It ended up on Lee Price and went to Eddie. So obviously Flash Thompson is in New York. He's like trying to figure out where the suit is. He sees that it's back on Eddie Brock and he's curious why the suit would go back to Eddie Brock after everything and why not, why it wouldn't come after him. And so they kind of do like Dan Slott and Mike uh, Costa kind of do touch on that. I wouldn't say they give a solid answer to that question, but they do touch on it and kind of, you know, look at those characters and dissect them in that way and bring everyone together. So one thing, again, like I said, I like about this book is kind of the tone and pulling all these elements together. So them bringing Flash Thompson in, he steals this, you know, card, uh, had them having that, had them having Eddie and his relationship with Dr. Steve and everyone at Alchemex building up still is all there, which I really like. So they don't sacrifice any of the continuity that's happening in the comics. They take everything. They go, okay, Black Hat's the kingpin of crime. We're going to use that in our story. And Eddie's going to Alchemex. We're going to use that in our story. And Flash is looking for the suit. And I like that. I like that Flash didn't give up. He kept looking for the suit and was trying to, you know, find it and, and know that it's okay, at least. Even if it doesn't bond with them, he wants to know it's okay. And meanwhile, while he's here, obviously Andy is, you know, taken down in Philadelphia. So when he hears about that, he wants to go back and help her. But at this point, uh, he had already uh, confronted Venom and Spider-Man. And so they get in this big fight at Alchemex. And, uh, and during this, Spider-Man sees this anti-venom, uh, you know, vat of chemicals. And he's like, wait, I know that stuff. That's, is that anti-venom? He's like, yeah, you know, it's Dr. Steve's like, it's a th synthetic one. And so he goes, fine. He's like, I I'll use it to help out. So he kicks the vat over and spills it all over Eddie and Flash who are fighting over the symbiote. And the symbiote, it, it, it's confused. It's like, it wants to bond with Flash because it misses him. And now it has an opportunity to get back with him. But it also likes what it's trying to rebuild with Eddie. And so it's divided. And so while it's divided, some of the symbiote is on Flash and he gets hit with the anti-venom, uh, you know, synthetic, and it bonds with the symbiote and then bonds with Flash, turning him into agent anti-venom. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So I, and I liked the anti-venom story. I liked when they did that with Eddie Brock and the big thing he did, which was he sacrificed the anti-venom suit to save everyone in New York from, you know, Spider Island and stuff. So the fact that it has that heroic connotation to it and connection to it and now it's on Flash is like pretty cool because Flash is a very heroic guy. So again, there's elements in this that I like. But once we get past the alpha issue and we get into this, where Lee Price starts spitting on people's faces and building his army of symbiote-possessed people, it starts to lose me, to be honest with you. <laughs> so that's now that we got all that set up, 
that's pretty much the rest of the book. The rest of the book is just Spider-Man hating Eddie and wanting to fight him um, and then teaming up with Flash and taking the suit from Eddie and, and bottling it up and you know taking it away. They end up bringing it to uh, Peter Parker's apartment. And at this point in the comics, he's dating Mockingbird. And uh, and so they're like he's living with her because he doesn't have a place to stay uh, now that Parker Industries has like kind of crumbled. So uh, so he's staying with Mockingbird and he brings the symbiote there in a tube to like stay in their bathroom <laughs> or something, um, which causes like, you know, destroys the bathroom because it escapes, obviously, eventually. And Mockingbird later in the story comes home and sees that. And she's like, you know, yells at Peter and she's like, you're getting your own apartment. We're, I'm tired of living with you. So. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's some comedy and, and some fun moments in this. But I never really I didn't get into the, the you know, Mockingbird Peter Parker relationship too much. Eh, it didn't do much for me. I like Bobby. I think she's a great character, but I was kind of like, eh, eh, it, did, it didn't really, I was kind of glad it, it went by really quickly. It just felt more like Dan Slott writing weird slash fiction and, you know, and not really writing good stories. Um, and that's kind of the thing here. I feel like that's where, even though the tone is kind of, you know, balanced fairly well, I, Dan Slott's writing around this time and Spider-Man started to lose me. Like, I actually kind of like Dan's run overall, mostly, but it did kind of lose me around this part. And then we get into the Red Goblin story afterwards, which, you know, had some good moments, but it didn't really thrill me too much. Um, it's usually when he teams up with, um, he has another writer, he, uh, Christoph Gage, uh, Christos Gage. When he when he teamed up with Christos Gage, I, I like his stuff a little bit more. But uh, when he writes solo, he kind of loses me around this era of his comic book. Um, but up until the, you know, the Superior Spider-Man stuff, like, for example, I really liked. Um, but then after that, he started to lose me. So this is kind of when there's moments that I kind of wince at or cringe at. It's it's usually on the issues that Dan Slott wrote. But luckily, it's got great Ryan Stegman art. So I didn't, you know, wince or cringe that much or too long because at least the artwork was really pretty. Um so, uh, so anyway, so Spider-Man and Flash are, are trying to work together to take down Lee, um, and they both go and attack him, but they get captured, and uh, and then, you know, the symbiote, it, you know, kind of consents that a little bit, so it tries to break out, and it does break out of the bathroom by going through the drains, um, and then comes out the other side, and then goes around New York, um, you know, looking for Eddie Brock, and what I like is there's a, there's a moment where, uh, well, first of all, Black Cat and all of her people, I saw this image earlier, because it's, it's at the front of the graphic novel, she gets taken over, as do all of her henchmen, Scorpion, you know, Hammerhead, everyone that worked for her. Um, but she is cognizant enough, I think, to like, you know, she goes up to uh, Flash Thompson and kisses him. And they used to date at one point, too. Uh, so so Spider-Man's like, uh, guys, this is not the time. Like, I know you're trying to rekindle old relationships, but this is not the time. Uh, but it turns out she is cognizant enough to break out of the the mind control that the symbiote on her face has over her because lee price is basically creating a hive mind he puts that on on you and then he can kind of influence you he's like a voice in your head um and so uh so she has that on her but she's able to kind of see through it a little bit and kisses flash and the anti-venom stuff burns her symbiote off her face so she you know gets free um so yeah so that was just kind of neat showing uh you know that she's tough enough, I guess, or her luck powers or something gave her the advantage so she could escape. And then she does that to try to help Spider-Man, but uh, she's unable to, and Spider-Man and Flash get beaten up by all these symbiote-infected people and villains, and they get captured, um, like I said. And that's when the suit is like, all right, I got to get out of here. So it does, and it goes down the drain and escapes. So Black Cat runs into Eddie Brock uh, because her luck powers. She's like, I just need to get out of here. I, get, I need to get out of here. And then boom, she runs right into Eddie Brock and is like, oh my God, Eddie Brock. And she's like, uh, I, you know, I should kill you. And he's like, he's like, uh, look, I'm looking for my symbiote. And she's like, yeah, well, Lee Price has it. And, you know, and things aren't going well in there. And he's like, no, that's not my symbiote. Lee has a different symbiote. And he goes, but now that I'm around you, maybe my luck will change. And as the symbiote is moving through the sewers and there's these guys down there going like, yeah, we're down here repairing a pipe, but we were told there's dinosaur people down here, but that's just a rumor. There's no way that's real. And then Venom shows up and runs past them and they go, I, they're like, I quit. <laughs> like, I don't want to work this job anymore. So I like that humorous moment, but then the suit works its way up and finds, I uh, go through the sewers up to the streets and finds Eddie because like I said, luck is kind of on Eddie's side now because he's around Black Hat. So he becomes Venom again. Um, so I like, like, you know, there's moments in this that I thought were kind of fun. And overall, um, I, I enjoyed. But every time they do, they cut to Lee Price and his plan of like taking people over and wanting to be a criminal empire. 
it's just so bad. Like, I don't know. It, it's a weird motivation. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. And at the end, he just changes his motivation. He goes, eh, this doesn't, this isn't working. I'm going to do this now. And it, I don't know, like, I guess it's like a, he's a think on your feet kind of guy. So maybe that makes sense. But I just, it wasn't working for me. So anytime Lee Price showed up in this, I kind of didn't like it. And then I also didn't really care for this too much. Spider-Man and, and Flash get captured. They chain Flash up and they're just going to burn him. They're going to put him in the incinerator and kill him uh, because they can't possess him because he's got the anti-venom symbiote on him. But Spider-Man, they can possess. So they put a, you know, a symbiote on Spider-Man and he runs around with two guns robbing people as Spider-Man. And they, I don't know. And they're doing that because Spider-Man's not very well liked at this point in the comics in New York. And they're, this is going to add to that drama and everything. And I just thought it was a silly, unnecessary idea because it only lasts for like an, barely an issue and then he gets freed from it. So really the ramifications aren't that intense and he doesn't really go over the line too much. And he's also wearing a different mask because he's got the symbiote mask on him over his Spider-Man suit. So he could easily say it's not him and that it was someone in a different suit. So I don't know. I, I just wasn't digging it. Um, but Flash though, he, he, does, he can't get out of the situation because the fire's hurting the symbiote. So Andy shows up. And so I like that. I like that Andy came to his rescue and we get a great moment with her. And it seems like these guys kind of liked, you know, they enjoyed writing that character because they gave Andy some stuff to do in this. And I appreciated that. Um, so Venom and Black Cat go to Alchemex. And what's cool about this is that she meets Dr. Steve and, you know, she they talk about the anti-venom uh, symbiote and uh, and if they can, you know, learn anything from it and they want to take down Lee Price. And, you know, they're, they're trying to get answers and get help. That does kind of set up Black Cat robbing Alchemex or kind of robbing Alchemex in King and Black, which was one of the tie-ins to King and Black that I really loved was that she took the Spider-Mobile with her two henchmen and they are her thief partners or whatever. And she steals the anti-venom symbiote from Alchemex and gives it to Doctor Strange to free Doctor Strange. And this is kind of a precursor setup to that. Like, you know, I can't remember the writer who wrote that, um, that King and Black story, um, but they clearly, you know, read this and they and they saw the setup here and used that for their story. So I I, I was like, hey, that's cool. That reminded me of the, the King and Black King, uh, Black Cat story. And this is how she meets Alchemex and, and Dr. Steve and stuff and knows about the anti-venom symbiote. So just all cool things. Um, but then you get you get this moment here with Spider-Man. He goes to the Daily Bugle and Betty Brant's there, and she's like, uh, you know, you're not Spider-Man. He doesn't act like this. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he turns and points a gun at her, I think. And then Flash shows up and he's like, stay away from her, you know, to defend Betty. Um, so you get a little, you know, Betty Flash moment in there without her. I don't think I think she knows maybe he's Venom at this point. So, um, so yeah, anyway, this is just I don't know. It gets a little hokey with the Spider-Man thing um, and them having to, like, take him down when it's like it's so easy. Just you know, like Flash didn't even have to do that. Flash could have just went up behind him and touched his face and burned the thing right off. You know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but instead, they had like a four-page fight over it. Um, and then Venom shows up with a, a bunch of guns <laughs> and like bullets around his chest. So, um, they, I don't know. This story, like I said, it gets kind of hokey and weird. And it gets to a point where Lee Price is like finally revealing what he really wants. There's all these crime families out there that are uh, doing like this bid or this, this rich house. They're doing an auction. Um, and they're trying to take over New York. And they want to like rein in on the you know, Black Cat as the kingpin, they want to rein in on her territory and all these things. And Lee's like, no, this is like some of the, the five top mob families in the world. And they're all meeting of, you know, of all places here and outside of New York. So I'm going to go and take them over, which he does by putting little symbiote pieces in all their food. So as they ate at this big banquet event, they all become possessed by Lee Price, um, which I don't know, I guess that's kind of a clever idea, uh, easy way to, to get everyone under your control. But then it just leads into the last issue, which is just a full issue of, you know, uh, Andy and uh, Andy over here, Black Cat, Anti-Venom and Venom and Spider-Man just all, you know, coming in to uh, raid this giant mansion and fight uh, you know, all the villains, all the possessed villains like Hammerhead, Scorpion and Lee Price and everyone. And Spider-Man tries to go in and fool them like he's, you know, still under their control. But then he makes a joke because he can't help himself. And that reveals to Lee Price that he's not under his control anymore. So that was kind of funny because Spider-Man's like, God dang it, I, I just can't help myself. <laughs> I have to make a joke sometimes. Um, but it does uh, it does lead to a big battle. And then this is where I talk about where the story just kind of gets a little messy where Lee Price, like, I want to take over these organizations. I want to take over these families. 
And then when push comes to shove, he gets cornered by, you know, Venom and Anti-Venom and everyone's fighting him. He's like, you know what? Screw my old plan. I don't know why I, I stretch myself so thin. I'm just going to call all the symbiote spits, you know, slivers that I spit on people. I'm going to call them all back to me and I'm going to become like a super venom kind of thing. And so that's pretty much what he does. He just becomes this giant venom monster like this um, and is like, you know, it's almost like, uh, what was it? The Planet of the Symbiotes where Carnage absorbed a bunch of symbiotes and became big at the end. This is the Lee Price becoming big like that at the end. But the difference is, is I was like, but these all symbiotes came from him. Like he spit on people. And I guess there was maybe just a little bit of symbiote in there. And it, it bonded with the saliva. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not really going to dissect the science. It's not really that important. But my I guess my issue was, was he had one symbiote and split it up over, you know, so many people. If he called it all back, wouldn't he just be a regular size symbiote like Mania was? So it's just... I don't know, it was weird to me that the symbiote somehow grew and he was able to absorb more than he distributed. Um, so I was just kind of thinking of that. I mean, maybe there's a reason for that. So if, if you know it, like, let me know down below. But I just was kind of like, ah, oh, so Carnage had to absorb actual other symbiotes. Lee just brought back the ones he distributed. So how does Lee grow in size? I don't know. It just uh, It didn't make a ton of sense to me. But not that it matters too much, but I just it did make me think for a second. I was like, well, how is that possible? But, um, but Lee being a giant symbiote does beat the crap out of everyone uh, including venom and anti-venom and he's he's roughing them up pretty bad um like anti-venom gets his head kicked in pretty much um because he's obviously the, the bigger threat so lee price tries to take him down first and that forces everyone else to try to you know uh, uh, deal with lee and when, when they don't have their you know their uh basically their MacGuffin, you know, they don't have their white knight to their anti-venom to, you know, weaken Lee Price. Um, so that's when Andy goes, you know what, he has another allergy, which is fire. So I'm going to hit him with some hellfire. And that was pretty awesome. So again, Andy, she was kind of told, hey, stay out of this. It's going to be a nasty fight. And this guy's a trained killer. We don't want anything to happen to you. And she's basically like, look, I can't stay on the sidelines, uh, especially when Flash got hurt the way he did. So I'm going to step up and fight. And I liked, I thought that was great. And then uh, there was a great moment where Peter goes and gives a pep talk to Flash. And he's like, hey, man, you know, you got to get up. You're my number one fan. And and uh, and Flash, like, yeah. Like, and then, you know, it, 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 basically Peter is just, like, opening up to him and saying, like, you're a hero. You're all these things. And thinking that Flash was, like, dying in a way. And then Flash goes, okay, man. Yeah, I'll be up in a second. The suit's healing me. And Spider-Man's like, oh. He's like, so, okay. He's like, so my pep talk didn't work? It was the suit? And he goes, yeah, sorry, buddy. <laughs> so that, that was, again, just kind of a humorous moment that I kind of enjoyed in this um, while this big fight is going on. Because pretty much this whole last issue, because they had an alpha issue, and then they did like, you know, two issues of Spider-Man and two issues of Venom, and then an Omega issue. So this is six issues all in this big trade paperback. And uh, and the last issue, the Omega one, is pretty much this big fight. It's all everyone fighting at the end. Black Cat, Flash Thompson. Um, they have this uh, Predator moment here which I appreciated. I wish they didn't call it out. Uh, he actually says, dude, you're ruining this Carl Weathers, Arnold Schwarzenegger moment. I'm like, I wish you didn't say it. I like, I wish you didn't put that in the dialogue. It's clear that that's a predator handshake and it's the same frame, same amount of face of theirs and everything from the predator movie. So them saying it, I was kind of like, oh, you're kind of ruining the joke. <laughs> like it's, that's, that's just a great visual uh, nod. That's one of those moments as an editor where I would have cut that dialogue. I'd have been like, if people don't get this reference, it's fine. The people who do will love it and doesn't matter. You don't, you know, don't, don't uh, spill, spell it out. Um, but, uh, but in the end, you know, also Eddie gets a pep talk from Black Cat and Spider-Man 2. And they're like, we need you. Like, we need you in the game. You're Eddie Brock, you're Venom. This is, you know, mania is from you. We need you to step up. So Eddie does along with Flash and they cover Lee with the anti-Venom symbiote. Um, and they're like, take your medicine, Lee. And they uh, wipe out his uh, symbiote and, dis and destroy it, pretty much. Um, well, I mean, traces of it are everywhere. So I don't know, like, how, like, it's destroyed. But anyway, right at the end, Lee, as a last-ditch effort, tries to spit on Flash. He also tried to spit on Black Cat during the final battle, but it didn't work. Apparently, after you get possessed once and get rid of it, you can't be possessed again. I guess that was something they just threw in there. Um, I guess your mind is aware enough now to where you can't be hive-minded by Lee Price. 
So basically, I think that was just their way of saying this can never happen again, <laughs> pretty much. But now Lee Price is dead. He got killed in absolute carnage. So um, so I guess it can't happen again, uh, at least by Lee Price. So in the end, though, they, they take down the big bad guy. They beat Lee Price um, and they, you know, bring him to jail or they arrest him. And that's where he obviously goes to uh, the prison that he's in. I don't know if it's the raft or somewhere where he's in absolute carnage where he dies. But this is the last time we see Lee Price until he dies, which is fine by me. I'm not a big fan of the character. Uh, but Eddie Brock here at the end, you know, Spider-Man's like, all right, you know, you're a murderer and I'm bringing you in. And Flash says, look, like, I'm sorry, Pete, but this guy, I know he has a checkered past and I know he's made mistakes and he's and I know he's responsible for a death. And he goes, but. You know, and I, I think Flash as a soldier, who's also been responsible for people dying as a soldier, you know, fighting for his country, I think he was like, look, we all have, we, we have read in our ledgers, we, we have bad things in our past and things we're not proud of. And I'm sure Eddie, if he looked back, he regrets that death. And Eddie's like, I do. And he goes, every day I do. And he's like, so there you go. Like, I'm willing to forgive the guy because he was a big help in this fight. And the suit chose him. And I have to trust that the suit, it knows what it's doing. And, and Spider-Man's like, it's a crazy alien from outer space. And Flash, like, you never gave the suit a chance, you know, Peter. Uh, not really. Once you found out what it was, you rejected it. And he goes, you never really gave it a chance to be something, uh, you know, be something heroic. Like, the, you know, like the rest of us are trying to be. And I actually like that line. That's true. After now rereading through the Black Costume Saga and talking about it, I, I agree. I, Peter never gave the suit a chance. And I like that Flash kind of calls him out on that. So that whole ending there where Flash kind of forgives Eddie and shakes his hand and he says, you're a good man. And, and Eddie's like, you are too. Thanks for teaching the suit about being a, a hero. I will do my best to, you know, to live up to that. And I was like, what a great moment. And then Flash goes and talks to Andy and, uh, you know, and they, they um, kind of get their closure moment too now that he has a suit again, but she doesn't. But she's like, yeah, I'm still a threat, though, with the Hellfire, so maybe we can still be a team. And he's like, all right, let's go back to Philadelphia, and, you know, I'll keep an eye on you. So uh, so that was cool. And then Spider-Man, you know, gets his moment where he goes back to his apartment, and his girlfriend's mad at him for the symbiote ruining their bathroom. So uh, so that was, like, a nice, funny moment to end on, even though I'm not a big fan of that relationship. But it was a nice, funny moment. And then here we get that moment I talked about earlier where the book ends, and Eddie and Black Cat are talking, and she says, you know, like, uh, you know, my whole empire is gone. The villains will never work for me again. My, you know, I'm not the kingpin anymore. There's already new people trying to take over. Even Wilson Fisk is thinking about coming back and stuff. So um, I, I looks like I'm, I lost my opportunity. And Eddie says, yeah, but that's okay. Like, uh, you did a great thing tonight by being a hero. And I think we need more of that. This city needs more heroes. And so maybe you just weren't destined to be a villain, just like I wasn't destined to be a villain. Maybe we, you know, we chose poorly and we need to do better. And I, I thought that was great. So this book ends on that note. And I thought that was a great note to end on. So even though I'm mixed feelings on this, like the, all the Lee Price stuff, his motivation, like the plan, like the villain stuff with him, you know, conquering other people. And eh, I didn't really enjoy that too much, but it does facilitate the, I think the overall plan, which was we need to get Black Cat. We wanted to be a hero again. Uh, so it feels, you know, facilitates that storyline. Um, we want to tell another Lee Price story and we want it to be a little different than previous stories. And it's like, okay, well, it was a little different. I, I may not have enjoyed it too much, but it was a, a little different than stuff we've seen before for the most part. Um, and then they wanted to bring Flash Thompson back and give him a suit again. Um, and then they obviously wanted to deal with the, the clone symbiote of mania that was set up in the Daniel Way run. And they wanted to finally either destroy it or, or wrap that up completely. Uh, so that way they didn't have that other thread out there of like this confusing clone sliver of, you know, of venom. And it looks like we got a closure to that, uh, that character as well, which was set up in the Daniel Way run and now concludes here. So all of these things are, I think is what was on the table. I think when you look at this as editors, you're like, okay, these are these plot threads from these different books that we want to address and kind of wrap up and, and clear up. And they found a way to do that all in one. And so that's where I, like I said, I give the editors credit on this one, which is Nick Lowe um, and Devin Lewis, uh, who I know I've been critical of before at times, but um, I thought they did a good job. And Allison Stock and Tom, Grom uh, Tom Groman, um, who is the assistant editors, I think everyone, as far as an editing standpoint, 
were on their game with this as far as like taking all these plot threads and working with their writers to to tie it all together um i saw when i was reading this a bigger picture for the marvel universe while reading this of of these things they have to tie up and i think that was very clever the way they did it and pulled it off even if i didn't like some of the story elements every story element still works towards wrapping up one of those threads and sometimes that's very important because you want to put characters you know when you when you're writing comics especially characters like this there are times where you're like i need like oh someone wants to do something with black cat we got this great pitch but it doesn't work as a, a crime story so we need her back to this state and oh we have ideas for flash thompson and how we're gonna maybe dance lots like i i know how i'm gonna kill flash thompson and i want him to be in the final battle against red goblin so having him be an anti-venom would be really cool so can we set that up and it just seems like all these elements were like if they fell in pretty well and even if they were forced into this story i feel like they were they were still handled with 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 care uh, to some level so I am 50-50 on the book in general as far as, as far as my enjoyment of it, but I kept seeing this bigger editor picture, uh, you know, as I was reading it going, oh, this is why this is, and this is why that is. And because I could answer those questions, it made me appreciate the editing team a lot on this storyline. So to give them a big shout out, because I know I've been critical at times, you know, not always, but sometimes I've been critical of the editing teams on the Venom books and stuff. And I will, but I, I'm happy to give them a big shout out in this final Mike Costa run um, because, you know, because this is the last time we're going to talk about a Venom comic that's in continuity by some of these editors. And I'm glad I get to end on a positive note with them and just say like, you know, you all, I know editing's not easy. I've done it for years and I know, and I, but I haven't done it on the level you guys do. So mad respect to people who edit big you know tier books like spider-man and batman and all these you know big titles i know it's not easy i can't imagine it is because even on a small scale of the stuff i edited those weren't easy <laughs> those weren't easy to keep track of sometimes so i can only imagine what it's like for characters like this so props to you i thought you killed it on this book as far as pulling all these threads together and making them work and setting all these characters up for future stories outside of this story and although i feel like it made this story suffer a little bit not too much because there was enough fun in it that I enjoyed it. And even though there was some wincing and cringy moments at times with some of the dialogue and some of the uh, situations, I, overall, like I, I didn't hate this book. And I would say, although it's one of my, probably one of the weaker stories in the Mike Costa run, I don't know if it's as weak as the first story with Lee Price, although I found some of that interesting too, but I don't think it was that weak, but it's, it's certainly not as good as like the Craven story, which was a lot of fun, or the dinosaur people with Moon Girl, um, or Nativity, which I think is a great ending to this story. So, uh, so yeah, so those are my thoughts. You know, I'd love to hear yours. I've talked long enough about this. Let me know what your thoughts are down below. If you agree with me, disagree with me, have different nitpicks, whatever it is about Venom Inc., let me know what it is. But I think from a editorial standpoint, this was a hit. Like this was, this put a lot of characters in really interesting positions for future stories. And sometimes you need to do that in, in comics. To, and it, sometimes you sacrifice the story you're telling to do that. But I didn't feel like they sacrificed too much. I feel like they still had a good A to B story in this one. And even though I didn't like some of the, the steps along the way, it still works overall. So if you agree with that or disagree, let me know down below and we'll continue the conversation down there. And that is it. We have talked about all the Venom comics in continuity for the most part. Um, up until, you know, uh, currently with the Al Ewing stuff, which I'm not going to dive into probably ever. I think we had a good jumping off point with King and Black. And uh, there are some other world stories, though, like um, there's the, the Venom uh, Spider-Man Red Sonia book we haven't talked about. Uh, I think Venom popped up in a She-Hulk issue once that we didn't really mention. So there's a couple things out there that's still lingering that we can discuss and, we'll, and we will before the show ends. Um, or before this season of the show ends and, and I figure out whatever I'm going to do with the next version of this. But, uh, but for at least for now, like, um, this is kind of an end uh, to an era of us talking about, uh, major incontinuity Venom stories. And so for that, I, I can't thank you enough. This completes the playlist, at least for now. Um, so if you're watching these on the playlist, you still got more videos to go. You got plenty more, but in the order we recorded these in, which was way out of order and we jumped all over the place. Um, the playlist at least is all the stories in order. So you still got more to watch if you're watching on the playlist. But if you have with us here, actually, when we're filming this episode 700 and whatever, um, you know, thank you. Thanks for being on this journey 
with me and, and spending the last four years of your lives checking in on me from time to time and talking Venom with me. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And this character means more to me now than I ever thought he could. And I think that comes from your, your passion for him. Uh, when I started this, I was a Tom Hardy fan that just kind of knew about Venom and liked the character and had his own ideas about the character, but those ideas have changed. Now I see Eddie Brock for who he really is, and I, and your passion was infectious. You know, your passion spread to me and made me passionate about this character. So thank you so much for, for being here and supporting the show, and hopefully I can still make uh, more episodes about other world stories uh, coming up for you very, very soon. And we still got Symbiote Spider-Man stories to talk about, so we'll get into those soon as well. So thank you, and for now, this is goodbye on this chapter of uh, this show. But maybe, you know, we'll get lucky and, and have other chapters to add on later in the future. So I will see you in that future. Thanks so much for watching. Peace.